Hey, we are live. This is John Reed. <laughs> now, ordinarily, you, you all know that I can get a little grouchy, and I have had a little bit of a grouchy day, which maybe we'll get into at some point. But I'm actually in a really good mood. The whole thing has shifted because I've got Stacy Harris with me. Stacy, welcome. Thank you for having me on board. And I and I don't mind a little grouchy. We, we you know, I always say all right. Chris can be can be an interesting conversation, right? <laughs> Yeah, it, it's just the balance has to be right there between yeah. grouch and and curious. So I've, I've got to make sure we get that right. But but no, um, I've wanted to have Stacy on the show for a while. And this and I want to explain to you all a little bit about why that is. But but before that, I do want to tell you that today Stacy has prepared for us based on her unique research, uh, the top uh, five HR tech miss that she's going to bust. And then we're also going to talk about some underrated keys to HR product success. So I'm really excited to, to have Stacy unveil that for you. But but before we get into that, I do want to tell you a little more about why Stacy is is on this um, uh, video show with me. Uh, one of the reasons is because when, when I go to um, analyst events, I got to tell y'all, 90% of the audience questions from analysts, sorry, analysts, are softballs and self-serving crap that does not illuminate anything for anyone. And it's frustrating to me and I get really grouchy. <laughs> Stacy, I've seen her press the issue myself with, with vendors in the best way possible, try to get clarity on product direction, messaging and things that really matter to customers making decisions and also all of us. So that's reason number one, why Stacy's on the show because she's willing to raise her hand and say, I'm going to try not to blush, but thank you. <laughs> yeah. So that that's number one. But number two, uh, we're having a dinner at uh, the Unit 4 event, actually. Uh, and, you know, it's funny, too, because of these dinners, like it's like this dinner roulette. You never know, like, who you're going to end up with, <laughs> you know. And a lot of times I, f I find I'm, like, end up with, like, really strange people. I'm like, why do they set, set me next to, like, this Gartner person who's, who's sung their magic quadrant because that's not a good fit for me. But I found myself next to Stacy. We had a really good talk about how you do research at, at Sapien Insights, where you are, by the way, the chief research, research officer and managing partner. Uh, if your LinkedIn profile is up to date. Is, yeah. Uh, cool. Uh, and we talked about it and I was really fascinated to hear a little more about your research model because frankly, I, I have a lot of problems with how research is done in our industry. You do your research a differently. So can you explain a little bit about just what you do in that model and kind of how that's evolved to the point that it is today? Yeah, it's it's a, it's a long story. I'll try and keep it short. So um, I took over what is what we now call our annual HR system survey and really the research model that we run because we, we're now doing this on finance systems as well. Um, from Lexi Martin, some of you might know her name, um, back in the day, uh, about eight years ago, she had started running this great HR technology survey in the market. And it had always been, I think, an, a vendor agnostic research effort, but it was always focused on big companies and there was a lot of focus on sort of how people were adopting technology. Um, we did get user experience and vendor satisfaction in there, but it was but it was just a, a few questions. When I took over about eight years ago, we took what amazing base she had for that research and we just added to it in a way that we, the way basically we send our research out is anyone can participate in our research, which means any organization or association or vendor who wants to know more about what their customers are saying can send a link out to our research. Um, and then and nobody has to pay there. We don't, nobody, nobody, um, they, to get into our, our report, all you have to do is get 3% or more of our data set basically, which means that we know that you have a, a valid number of customers who participated in our research. And then we basically not only share what people are using from an HR technologies perspective, as well as how they're, um, leveraging it and what outcomes they're getting in their organization. But we also spend a lot of time trying to get what we call the voice of the customer, which means our respondents who are HR technology practitioners and heads of IT and CIOs and even CEOs and CFOs, all of them respond to our survey. We get any number of them. They tell us their true feelings about what's going on with their HR technology, both the user experience, because we think that's really important, and the vendor satisfaction. And, um, and all that data comes back to us. Um, it's all anonymized. We give averages and there's no, you know, it's interesting. We, we were having this conversation about, you know, there are some vendors who are less interested in making sure that the link gets to their customers because they don't want to know what 
their customers are going to say, or they're concerned mm-hmm. about what their customers are going to say. They, there's you can't sway our data, right? Because our data is what it is. It's it's the customer data, and that's how we approach it. Um, now, we as an organization, we are a research firm. We do have subscriptions people can buy, and we have subscriptions that vendors buy, and finance analysts, and people in the industry are trying to know more data. So I don't want to make it sound like we're you know we are an organization that that has to figure out how to fund research. But my approach has always been to make sure that we start with the voice of the customer. And I think the data will lead us to the findings because I think a lot of vendors, all research is good. But when a vendor goes out with their idea of what they think is right, or anybody goes out with a research where they say, I have a hypothesis, I'm just trying to prove it. um, It can oftentimes come back with the answer you thought you were going to get instead of starting with a lot of questions and making sure you're getting sort of the outcome you the, the market is really telling you. So that that's our approach right now. I, I love this model for a couple of reasons. One is because you are getting the real deal from customers, which is one reason why I'm right, really looking forward to doing these countdowns with you to kind of find out what customers really think about, because let's face it, HR tech is larded up with buzzwords, um, <laughs> some of which I'm guilty of using. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. But um, so I really like that model, but I also really like it because go where the data is and what, what it tells you, I think is so powerfully important for true transformation. I don't think you can ever really improve until you get a realistic look at where you stand, but it's not easy, right? Like it's not an, it's not, it's not a a model that is as prevalent in our industry as it should be. I hope your business model has much success because I think it's great. So (laughs) yeah, yeah, no. And I would agree. It is, it is hard because I think, you know, everybody wants to hear the good news. They're not always as I, you know, excited to hear about what's not working. Right. And, and sometimes Mm -hmm. that's just as important as what's working. Right. Absolutely. I mean, to me, like one of the best things a vendor can have is the ability to point back and say, you know what, let's be honest, we didn't score that well in project quality a year ago. But look, we've we listened to you, we made these changes, and we've improved to me that those are the best stories. And I wish more vendors understood that. Um, One of the big problems that I have in our industry is that the lack of disclosures around research is so frustrating. And so you get these things from vendors saying, so-and-so found us in the top three performers or blah, blah, blah. And here's our report on this. And it turns out that the research was bought and paid for by that vendor to come to that conclusion. And, and look, I don't have a problem with the fact that vendors might buy, for example, your research, but the point is, let's say it's favorable to them. The point is they didn't influence the research. Yeah. Like the data came out the way they liked, so they bought it. I don't have a problem with that. What I have a problem with is this fundamental lack of disclosure in our industry about who's paying for what, because I think it does a profound disservice to customers. And look, Diginomica, we're, we're not perfect in this regard, but we do disclose on every single one of our blogs who our partners are. And, and to me, like, I don't see that in a lot of the research that's out there and, yeah. and, it, and it just should be because look, I mean, sponsored research doesn't mean it has no value. You know, y- you can get value out of sponsored research, but let's be honest about it at least. Yeah. You and know? I think that's the heart because I think some sponsored research does amazing. I love case Absolutely. studies and those really great deep dives on, on sort of maybe how people did their change management efforts or shifted. And, you know, I read the genomica stuffs all the time. I mean, I think you guys, um, yourself, Brian, other the guys who, who write for you guys, I get a lot of detail from what you guys write. And so for me, that shows that you are doing more than just a cover story on somebody's, you know, right. talking points. Yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes when you do have a close relationship with a vendor, you can, you can get details other people can. And that's part of the mix too. Um, anyway, if we all, if we all are upfront about how we're getting paid and acknowledge that we're all trying to get paid, it goes so much better, everyone. So let's just do that. And yeah. then we can all try to learn and get better. Um, so anyhow, uh, for those of you who are watching, just remember that your comments are part of the show. So please do type, do engage. Uh, it will be a lot better for everyone if you do that. So, And I'll keep working to try to say things that offend people until they start <laughs> fighting back. Let's start fighting back, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, so with that in mind, let's let's get started here a little bit with you. Uh, let's let's ru- let's start running through your top five HR tech myths that you're going to bust based on your your data. What would give us number five? So number one, I'm gonna I'm gonna burst the bubble of all the vendors out there. Investing in HR technology does not save you money. <laughs> This is the one, and and this was an early one that that um, both Lexi and I we tried to we, we did all the statistical analysis and we did all this return on investment. We we always get the what's my return on investment from HR technology, 
um, time and time again, we, we, sh we literally look at people's like revenue numbers and we look at their, you know, outcomes of the organization. And we have not been able to find true cost savings. You know, you find in pieces and parts, right? When you automate stuff. But I do think that what we find most is that what people get out of their HR technology investments is that it's more value creation than it is cost savings. And that value creation comes in the sense of, you know, better relationships with your employees. It also comes in better data for decision making. It's not as easily sort of um, create, you don't create business cases as easily around it. The other thing is, is that we're at a point now where all most organizations are, are getting HR technology earlier. So you if you don't have it, you don't have the same data to make the decisions that your competitors are, are making. So yeah, you might be running a bit cheaper because you haven't invested in it, but that means you're also not making the same, you don't have the data to make the decisions that they're making. So that's the other piece of it. But Stacy, we're going to put HR bots out there that's, that automate self-service workloads, and that's going to enable us to save on, on headcount and administrative costs with our HR technology. Your yes. data doesn't show that. Come on, <laughs> doesn't show that. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. In fact, in fact, I, I actually have a data point that shows that the more bots you have, sometimes the lower your adoption goes down because you have these competing sort of things going on in your organization. So um, it gets a little bit messy really quickly. <laughs> Got a couple of off-topic comments, but I want to welcome these folks to the program. <laughs> Meg Bear, who knows a hell of a lot about, about HR. Yes. <laughs> Meg, uh, please feel free to keep commenting. Uh, we agree that getting paid is is important. Yeah, I, look, I mean, look, there, there's there's good money to be had in this industry by delivering real value. So let's just focus on that is all I'm saying. Not not on propping up weak marketing bromides. Yeah. Um, Dr. Janice Presser likes my Woody Guthrie cap, so... Um, <laughs> It's a little That's bit a, of a little bit of a okay. trademark uh, from the Tulsa, Oklahoma Woody Guthrie Museum. But anyhow, I'm from Tulsa. For those of you who didn't know that about my background, <laughs> kind of weird. So, all right, so all right, so that's a really good and interesting point. And and around the HR, a uh, HR tech um, sort of cost savings thing. At the same time, I would assume that you still advocate for modernizing HR technology based on creating a more robust business case. And this reminds me of a lot of things we look at uh, in, in the ERP world as well around like the, the TCO based um, case is becoming less and less yeah. compelling. Like, yeah, we're just going to save money on IT or whatever. And let's look more at what the, what the real business value is. And I, so I assume you still are an advocate for modern HR tech, but more from a value creation standpoint than like a cost savings. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and I know that seems like, boy, are we really still talking about it, but you'd be surprised by how many people come to us and say, we need to create a business case on how much we're going to save money on. Right. Um, and, and both in resourcing infrastructure, all of it. And, I, and, and, you know, we always have to kind of say, no, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. If you look at our, our benchmark, it's, that's not going to be the case. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> Oh look! Now we've now we've now we've got all kinds of commentary on here about yeah. HR tech and 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 how much it's costing. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's deal with Brian's comments since it's blocking our faces. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and and also Thomas Weberneed. I want to walk. Well, man, we got some smart peeps in the chat, Stacey. We're gonna have to be on our game today. Uh, <laughs> Thomas, I'm really glad you made it, and I know you had a potential conflict. Thanks for being here, uh, Brian. Uh, before we read his comment, uh, Brian, of course, is a notable HR tech analyst and certified grouch as well. Yeah. Uh, and Brian owes some responsibility for you being here because Brian, Brian at one point said, you got to get Stacy on the show. And that's when my whole like Stacy recruitment effort really started. <laughs> so, so Brian says the ROI of HR tech is often bad as many core functions have been re-automated two to three times already. Yeah. Package economies create lots of... I was going to read that too. <laughs> Only, uh, I'm not sure, words. Brian. They're, you might have to help Texas us with that. Words, but they're new words. Yeah. <laughs> Create lots of incremental costs, but few incremental savings. You have to get into white spaces today to find value. Interesting comment from Brian. Brian, would you care to comment on what you perceive the white spaces in HR tech to be? That would be interesting. What do you think of Brian's comment? I think Brian is right on. And that's what I mean by value creation, right? I mean, I do think there are still some, some places to automate, but I think even when you automate, you're still you should still be looking at the fact that you are finding data or creating an environment that's that's going to help your organization sort of achieve an outcome, and it always has to be tied to an outcome you're trying to achieve. Absolutely. Okay, let's continue with our HR tech myth busting. All what right, we got for number four. 
my 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 next one is that everyone feels that everyone is on cloud technology already. So I think the whole world feels like all of HR has made the move that we are we are there and um, we're done with the on-premise world. Our data shows that we still have about 25 to 30 percent of organizations who are still actively using an on-premise application somewhere in their HR technology stack. So I think it's really hard for us as an industry to assume that everybody is at the same stage. Um, and many of them have figured out how to get a lot out of that on-premise environment and put layers on top of it. I think the market still has to figure out how to address those needs. So. Yeah, it's interesting because HR has a reputation for being like this early adopter for cloud, but the term cloud can be really highly abused as well, right? Yes. Be, because like if, if you want to talk about more of a multi-tenant type cloud environment, how many vendors truly offer multi-tenant cloud payroll localized for most regions in the in the world? Not very many. Not many yeah. And 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 so I think it's really important for customers to understand what they're getting into, right? With with HR and cloud and not to assume that just because a vendor says we're in the cloud that they really are. Yeah. Th that's a whole conversation. I'd be interested in the audiences is, you know, do they actually think that the, the buyers understand the word and how it's being used? And I would say from our, from our research, they probably don't still. Right. Brian has revealed his white spaces. Okay. Look at us. We got, Oh, he's got some good ones in here. Big data driven talent acquisition solutions. Uh, AI tools to spot and deal with psycho bosses. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you turn that around on the bosses, Brian. I love it. That's yes. <laughs> That's definitely white spaces. Brian, I thought employee surveillance was a, uh, was a white space too. Chatbots to replace 95% of inbound HR calls and emails. Yeah, absolutely. Can uh, and some people out there if chatbots replace it all. <laughs> by the way, if you do a search of, Brian Summer, HR Tech on Digitonomica. You can read about some of that because he's written about some of that yeah. on our site before. Shameless plug. But if you want the context for some of that, yeah. <laughs> what do you think of Brian's white space list? Are you, are you asking me or do you want the audience to, to weigh I'm in? I'm asking you. One? You're asking me. Well, I, the audience can weigh in too. Yeah, because I'd be interested in the audience's perspective on it. It's, it's, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus in on the psycho boss issue because I think it's a real, like, I'm not of the, the proponent that all people leave bad bosses. I think a lot of people stay in, in jobs for a long time, even with bad bosses, uh, data shows. But I do think that we have more data in our payroll systems that can tell us about what um, dysfunctional bosses we have in our organizations than most organizations realize. That's what I would say. Like your payroll system knows more than you do, right? Absolutely. And uh, Thomas says, not all vendors have proven they are better in the cloud than the on-prem vendors. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, and, 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 and this idea that cloud, cloud is a, yeah, better UX experience. You can work remotely, but that's just such a baseline understanding of what cloud can right. really do. Right. Like to me, it, where it starts to get interesting in HR is when you start thinking about, okay, now can we move beyond annual performance review checklists and can we have a more dynamic way of, of fostering manager you know, employee relationships, for example, uh, you know, that to me is where a cloud-based application starts to get really interesting in my experience. Yeah, it's the experience and the infrastructure. It's the ability to scale up and scale down as your workforce changes and to open up areas and, and think differently about your your engagement with that employee. Both of those can, can change how you think about your HR technology. Yeah. Thank you. So we are, if you're joining us, we are in the midst of Stacy's first countdown, she is busting the top five HR tech myths based on our research. What's number three? Number three, I think I might have, maybe I already said it, but but I but I'll but I'll I'll um, reemphasize it. Cloud applications are not cheaper to run than on-premise applications. Um, we've been running this analysis for quite some time. You you tend to get more value because you get more things in the cloud oftentimes than you do in an on-premise environment. But we definitely have found um, again and again when we do our analysis that people spend, when you take into account all things, even resources and infrastructure and hosting, because we include all that that technology, that you spend more money and you have moved your entire infrastructure to a cloud environment. Again, you get more for it and it's that value creation conversation. But I, the people who are, who are bemoaning that their budgets continue to increase in HR tech, 
aren't are, are probably um, uh, harking back to the fact that they probably didn't have to put in regular increments for HR technology because they they kept the same budget for their on premise environment for way too long. Any uh, any tips for customers in terms of really assessing the the benefits they actually got from cloud investments versus the realities? Is are there are there good ways to do that? We, you know, are, and this, this is going to be in my, my, um, how you, how you get better outcomes from your HR and your HR technology is the very, the most important one is to understand what you're trying to achieve with that HR technology. So this idea that, you know, if your goal is to reduce turnover, that's a value proposition. You should be looking at that. That should be something you should be tracking. And if you aren't tracking that at the point with your HR technology, you put in place for it. Then you're you're just not doing your the, the job right, right? That any any investment you would make in any technology or any business input, you would expect that you would you would um, sort of track whatever metric you went in on your business case. You'd be surprised by how many people put in an HR system and don't track metrics after that. Yeah, it's interesting too, right? Because metrics are important, but it depends on which metrics and. And a lot of the a lot of the good conversations right now to me are to figure out what the what the good metrics are. Like we talk about like like the reality of a psycho boss or a problematic manager. Like how do you do a metric for that, right? Yeah. You know, like oh, uh, it's like, oh, okay, there's a bunch of under underperforming employees that we're gonna pick on here, but actually no, there's a there's a different problem. And so how you measure that kind of stuff to me gets really interesting. Well, and I think this is where you really have to work with your HR function because so the payroll is really the reason I say that your payroll has more data than you probably give it credit for is if you have an environment where there's a constant need to adjust or audit the payroll of a certain region or a certain department or a certain function, there's a problem there. You, you need to figure out what that problem is, right? And if you just let that slide and let you know people sort of um, oh well, you know they're you know that 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 manager is always busy. Well, then either they're overloaded, they're not giving their employees enough communication, or there's some sort of management problem there. That's early indicators that you will not see in the performance data initially, right? Stacy, can I ask you uh, just your your opinion on this notion of whether AI enabled HR tools can actually help with, for example, more inclusive uh, hiring and, and promotions versus like the reverse, right? Because obviously it's something I know that Brian has written about on Diginomica a few times, uh, but this notion around how, how screening can, automated screening can actually be, be very restrictive as well. I think the hope is that, that AI powered tools can actually overcome human biases in, 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 in processes like hiring and promotion or, or perhaps compensate for those. But what is your stance on the, those technologies currently? My stance is that um, most of them are well-intentioned and most of them are trying to do the due diligence if you are talking to the vendor about how they're addressing biases. But I do think that we have to be really honest with ourselves that the data they're using to train those AI environments is our own historical data. And we are at the core of it, a, a community, particularly in HR, but across our business environments, right, that has predominantly, right, you know, not been inclusive and not been very good at, at managing diversity at an enterprise level inside our organizations. And so I think we have to make an effort to look at our training data and adjust and figure out how those adjustments might impact that data. And that's, that's hard because you're making adjustments that are going to impact human beings lives. Right. And, and then you have to validate it and then you have to be able to stand behind it in court. All of that is a scary proposition. So my sense is that I think it's great to do it. I think we should also run some of our traditional processes along the same at the same time. So you should be doing dual processes in almost any place where you're going to put AI in place. And I think you should also make sure that you are in clear partnership with the vendor around how you validate and can stand legally behind that data. And if you don't feel like you can have that conversation with the vendor, then you shouldn't be buying the product. That's Absolutely. my take on it. Thank you. Yeah. 
feel free to comment on that audience. That's, uh, I think, one of the most important, potent and important topics we could talk about today. Meg, says, Meg Bear says management and leadership are one of the biggest skills gaps that becomes even more important during times of transformation. Yeah. I would agree, and I'm really interested how HR technology can can support that. I've been privy to some management changes in some organizations lately that felt, frankly, unimaginative. And I, I'm, I'm curious how HR tech can kind of help challenge leaders on how they hire and what they look for in, in leaders. So, Meg, if you have comments on how best to do that, that would be cool. Dr. Janice Presser has a comment on psycho bosses. You need the specifics <laughs> know, of how they... We're not going to miss that. Yeah. You need the specifics of how they interact on both sides of the psycho boss victim relationship. Yeah. And unless you're dealing with a psychopath and then all bets are off. Yes. Um, thank you for that. All right. Well, let's, let's keep going while I try to catch up a little on the comments. What's your number two HR tech myth bust? Uh, are we on two? I thought we were or on we five. Are we on one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, right, right. So, we're, okay. So we're, this is number one then of the five. This is your last one. Okay. Yeah, this is my last one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Okay. So my, my last one is that a focus on employee engagement platforms or an investment in, get, in employee engagement platforms will not keep your top talent. This is a, this is a bit divisive right now in the market because everybody thinks they have this new employee engagement um, platform. Our data is showing at least that um, there is no connection at the moment between more surveying tools, more engagement platforms, more communications, and that improved talent outcome. Now, we'll continue to monitor it, but I, I think what we have to really be honest about is that improving our communications and improving our um, our asking of employees what they want and 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 this this user experience doesn't fix the issues around basic compensation levels. It doesn't fix the issue around the fact that we haven't given employees autonomy in their job roles. It doesn't fix the fact that they have so many roadblocks that they just don't want to deal with things anymore, or the fact that we haven't clearly defined roles in many cases. Those are the things we know have huge impacts on employees and their willingness to stay in organizations, along with other factors, right? But I think um, I think we oftentimes depend on technology to fix issues that are much more of a a fundamental cultural issue in our organization. Indeed. Well put. Uh, we've got some interesting stuff from Thomas Webernet on uh, the f drawbacks of how companies approach job postings and recruiting. Recruiting. He takes a shot at recruiters, <laughs> of which I used to be back in the day. Yeah, a lot of recruiters are part of the problem. Don't get me started on discriminatory job orders that circulate uh, from recruiters who are trying to make companies happy. Uh, yeah. Brian talks about uh, the data set biases in Silicon Valley firms that have average worker ages of 27. Yes. Um, <laughs> talk about an opportunity for ageism to get an unintended boost from AI. Though I think you could also make the argument that you, if you properly deployed an AI screening tool, you could try to do it to compensate for what you realized were biases in your data set, right? So... It's, yeah, I don't want to. Yeah, I, and I would agree with that. I don't want to say that all. I mean, because I think that some of these vendors have done phenomenal jobs in in trying to address what they know are are gaps or diversity issues inside of their data sets. I just think we, as um, in any alteration, it's sort of like a recipe, right? You fix this or you fix that. You don't know exactly what outcome you're going to get, right? It could be exactly what you were looking for. It could not. And so I think we have to approach it like we do any other scientific program, right? Test the waters, make sure that we're getting what we expect and make sure there's some sort of a parallel program going on at the same time to double check it, right? That's what validation is all about. Yeah, you know, I think what troubles me the most about AI from a kind of like a, a sort of buzzword perspective is it's not just a buzzword. It, it's systems that are operating in scale today without necessarily realizing the implications. And I think to your point, if you're going to use these tools, use them in a you know, in a more of a trial context and start understanding the implications of them before you roll them out. Because just about every week we see an article about some massively used AI system that like has deeply flawed unintended consequences. And it's like, well, why did you roll it out to that point? You know, yeah. um, and, and then you have the whole thing like with the IRS just recently with like, oh, yeah, we're, I guess, facial recognition like, a, you know, good. for ideas, maybe not a good idea. But how did that get to the point where it was approved at that scale? Right. Like yeah. at what 
at what point yeah. does do those things happen? Yeah, that's the thing I've never understood. And and we got some great minds on here, right? That, you know, so much of what we do, we're we're afraid to have guinea pigs in HR, just like we're afraid to have guinea pigs in education or anything that has a people-based component to it. Um, but you do have to test your stuff. You have to do a lot of tests, right? We're getting a couple of good comments from Megan Bryan about how basically companies need to have the organizational will to address the root problems that they surface via their data and that surveys and, and data have limited use if you don't have the jugular will, I guess you could say, to apply that. So, Yeah, I love bo both Megan and Brian commented on that engagement conversation. I just think there's so much buzz. When you talk about a buzzword, right, is the engagement platform, right? <laughs> yeah. Like that's going to fix all ills. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, uh, those who visited my show know that what I'd like to try to do is spend about – half of the show in a cathartic spleen vent making fun of stuff and and then i like to try to shift gears in the second half to really look at how we make these projects better because i think that's ultimately collectively our responsibility all of us like um including ourselves analysts you know whatever um it's our job to to help there um but before we do that stacy would you like to get any cathartic relief from any HR tech buzzwords that are getting you down these days. You did mention engagement platforms. Yes. <laughs> Is there any other uh, HR tech buzzwords that are bumming you out that we need to throw under the bus or? Oh boy. That's my favorite one right now. I get really frustrated with it. Um, Agile is the other one. I really would love to obliterate the fact because I think we've, we've taken that term and twisted it in so many different directions from what it was created as a, as a, as a development program. Right. Um, and we've, we've, I think there are better words to describe what we need to do in HR, which, which maybe are more flexible because agile assumes you're, you're going to change and make decisions quickly. Right. And I think anytime you talk about making quick decisions in HR, you're not really thinking about the impact you might have on people. Right. Cause, mm -hmm. um, you know, that is a concern. I think every HR professional, every HR strategy, every HR solution developer should be keeping in mind is that, you know, a button changed, a toggle not where it used to be is the difference between someone, you know, knowing where their benefits card is when their kid is sick and not, right? Uh, you know, or or understanding how they turn in their 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 um, hours at that point in time and getting paid that week or not, right? So I think we have to be really careful with what we do in HR in more ways maybe than we oftentimes realize. So I could, I would obliterate agile if it, if I could. <laughs> it is a tough one. And, and it's interesting how in our industry, we have these two conflated things because we have a formal uh, development methodology of agile. And then we have this sort of lowercase agile that's kind of being thrown into the mix all the time, right? To imply that we're like more somehow more adept than we used to be without really explaining why that is. So that, that is a good one. You know, I was trying to think about HR tech that really buzz me. It bothers me. I don't have a ton of like words in HR that really drive me crazy the way like CX for some reason has, has a ton of them like CDPs, for example, that it's like, come on, just stop yeah. it. But, um, but I, I will say that I struggle with, with well-being and the emphasis on employee experience only because of the hypocrisy factor that often comes out with it. And I feel like if you're going to talk about employee well-being, you better be ready to back it up. And I think that's where I actually think it's a really important concept and I really care about it. But I think that's why I get sensitive to it is because I think with those words, you better really be confident that you're that you're backing it up and that your customers are. Because just if you offer this great functionality and commitment to that, then what do you do when you discover customers that are exploiting their employees? Do you then terminate that relationship? Like, so to me, you're raising your standard when you use those words. And so that's what I'm looking yeah. for is the follow through. So that's, that's my only thing there. No, I, I think it's, uh, it's a valid point. I'd be interested in knowing some of the buzzwords that, but between the, the group on the, on the, um, chat here. I mean, they probably have seen all of the buzzwords, but I, I do think well-being is 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 definitely at the top right now. Um, we're seeing a lot of it. We're also seeing this idea that if I if I talk about well-being um, and I educate on it, it's enough, right? And I think that's you know 
knowledge is not the same as education and it's definitely not the same as understanding what well-being really is right so yeah yeah and i think there's also like a lot of date date you know data privacy implications for all of that too you know like like i i get this um thing from my healthcare provider saying uh, 24/7 therapy is now available if you're feeling stressed out or whatever and my first thought is like there's a reason why I don't do that as part of my formal health plan because I don't necessarily want that on there, you know, and, and I'm not saying that you should never get therapy or anything like that. But when you do stuff like that, you start thinking about what the implications are, especially because there's still a lot of stigma around mental health in our culture and, and having that stuff as part of your official records can cut both ways. And so I, I just think we have to think through these things and, have a really honest discussion about well-being from a data privacy standpoint as well. And obviously in the, in the post pandemic era, I think HR, whether they like it or not, are going to get a front row seat at, in that discussion. So. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to give you for free now my, my last, but I think most important underrated key to a better HR outcome. Cause it feeds oh, right into right. what you're talking about, John. Cool. Um, in 2021, we saw one and a half, times increase in organizations with a strategy for capturing and managing employee data footprint, which means people are starting to realize that they've got a lot of data on employees and they're capturing it more so now than they ever have. And we saw about 50% of organizations say that they added new systems in 2020 and 2021 that would capture more data on employees, right? Just a 50%. That's like more than half the companies added something that is capturing different data. Um, put in place an ethics board on employee data now. If you don't have it, you should, you're already late. To me, that's the number one thing. We, it is not just about managing the strategy of who has what data and who has what access to it. We need to have, every company should have an ethics board in place on what they should be doing with their employee data and what they should not be doing with their employee data. That's my two cents on what you just talked about. I like that one. Even even though you jumped the gun on your your Sorry. excellent tip, no, it's no, it's no, it's perfect though because we wanted to transition right into that anyway. Um, have you seen some? I don't want to put you on the spot too much, but have and you don't have to name companies, but have you seen some examples of companies that have actually done that or have started thinking about it? Because to me, like it makes all kinds of sense. But um, are there companies that are getting ahead of the curve on that? We, we've seen a couple. They generally have, have um, put them underneath like a digital practices group inside the organization. Like we see a lot of them being formed underneath that. Most of them are part of their, their data strategy for the employee data and the company data. Um, I have seen, to be honest, I think the vendors, um, you know, those included who are representing the companies here today, I think are doing a better job of it than I expected them to do. Um you know, uh, John Sumser, who's a friend of all of ours, has been working with a lot of organizations on ethics boards and data. Um, I think you're going to see that more. And I think the vendors have to lead the way in this case. I think if a vendor doesn't have an ethics board you know, that you're buying a software from, that's a pretty big red flag. So. Yeah, Mick says uh, ethics also a plan for transparency so that employees know what is yeah. being captured and why. Very true, Meg. I mean, particularly, Particularly if you are, I mean, I think in any organization, you should be transparent, but it, from a regulation perspective, you you can't be global if you don't have a transparency plan. Yeah. And a big thumbs up from Dr. Janice Presser on your, yeah. on your ethics tip. Okay. So we have already gone through one of your five. What we're doing <laughs> is we're going through, based on Stacy's research, she's sharing her, we're shifting gears now. We're doing a different countdown. This one is the five underrated keys to HR project success. So those of you who want to have better HR projects now is your time. What do you have yeah. another one for us? Yeah, take notes, guys, because because I'm I this is not just me saying it because I've been a consultant. I'm in the industry. Let me say that everything I'm gonna have here on my list, I have data backing it up, like years and years of data. Um, so first one is stop buying new technology. And then I'll put it with a caveat without putting in place adoption metrics and what outcome you are connecting it to in your business. So it's a little bit of a tag on, on what we've been talking about, but it truly is. I can't tell you how many times we we see organizations and our data who have, well, we, well, we just, you know, we've had it for a long time or we didn't like the interface or it wasn't really doing what we wanted with our end users. And then they're like, we don't exactly know 
um, the value of it, right? Because they didn't start the conversation with, um, you know, I we've got a lot of organizations who just replace stuff to replace stuff because they, they like to to have the newest things, um, and that does not get you sort of you know an emerging tech tag or anything. That what we find is those organizations oftentimes end up with more chaos, and the numbers don't show that there's value in it. So I, I just really figure out your ma- metrics before you put it in place. I like that one, and I think it's really interesting to to look at this from a from a pandemic software adoption standpoint because, mm-hmm. it, you know, when the pandemic hit, there was there was sort of essentially a bit of a surge in 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 SaaS software purchases that they were really about you know oh, we have to have better remote you know in cloud software and one thing I've been trying to push vendors on is like it's time to move past that generation of use cases around like yes we successfully went remote that's great. But um, now you have to look at a much deeper level of benefits of what you can do than that. And, you know, and, and I think I would hope that customers start thinking about that too and realizing, yeah, cloud, better cloud software is going to help us with our remote access, but that's not a use case in and of itself, right? That's a bonus and we need that, but that's not how we're going to justify it. To your point, if you scramble into that and you haven't established other ways of measuring your success, then when do you put those in? Like, yes. why not put those in from the beginning? Yeah. So I really like that. And yeah, I hope yeah. I hope the next generation of, of use cases can go well beyond, oh, we're so glad we're remote, you know? So. Well, and the unintended outcomes of not having the, the clearly defined goals that you're trying to reach, right, is, okay, so we put it in place and it was so we could go remote. Now we want you to come back into the office. Well, why should I come back in the office? You just bought a piece of software, which wasn't that the goal to get me to remote, right? Like those are conversations that are happening right now, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, I just saw this New York Times thing. I haven't had a chance to read it about how the mayor wants everyone to come back to the office again. <laughs> and uh, the employee, employees are like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I want to do that. All right. Yeah. Uh, well, um, uh, and, no, oh, go ahead, Stacy. I was just going to say, I was just going to move on to the next one. So I want yeah, to do that. that. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so the next one um, for me, it, it's a bit of a mantra. If anybody who's heard me talk in the past, I don't think this will be any surprise, but it's because I keep finding the data that supports it. And and, and again, I didn't go in looking for this data because I, I, I'm not a big proponent of change management. I think change management um, is really hard work and it would be great to just every piece of software should be something that's intuitive to use, right? Like in my mind, like like I pick up my phone, I shouldn't have to have change management. But I will say that our data finds time and time again, that if you have put in place some sort of continuous change management model, you get anywhere from 15 to 20%. And this is over a five year, year over year look, right? Like, like, like nothing, like anyways, it ranges between 15, 20% on average, it goes up to uh, to, um, 18%. Better outcomes in all outcome categories that we track. That's customer is, you know, our, our ability to increase customer satisfaction has gone up. Our ability to increase, you know, um, talent, you know, um, retention has gone up. All the HR talent metrics that we track, revenue metrics that we track, the one factor that seems to impact those two things, or there's really two, but I'll get to the second one here in a minute, is change management is the very first one. Um, and it continuous change management. We also found that people who basically do this kind of like, I do a little bit of money on change management as like a project, they actually waste money. That's not as valuable. Um, but if you do some sort of a model where you're continuously education, communicating what you're going on with your technology, it just ends up better. It's a lot of effort. I, I know. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, you know, I've, I've been a, a fan of change management for the longest time and I, feel like that it's a phrase that should never go out of style. But what I do get very interested in talking to customers is exactly what, what works best for that. And it's really interesting to hear the more creative approaches. Cause you know, you hear about some, like the, the best ones I hear about usually have things like open town halls, uh, mm-hmm. you know, um, Slack, ask me anything sessions, for example, is yeah. another one that as I've seen more lately, that's pretty cool. Um, It it seems to me that one of the real keys with change management is um, helping people understand what's in it for me, not just what's how it's going to make the company help the company make more money, but how it's going to make my life better. And and then this whole inclusive thing around that your input actually is going to get taken into account 
And to me, like, if you don't have that, then I think your change management is going to fall flat in my opinion. But, you know, I think those are, those are great comments. I'd be interested in hearing um, from, from anyone who's online, um, you know, that the, the specific practices matter, right. In this case, it is not just, I've, I've, I've put a budget line for change management. It's that I have built it into how we're, how we're structuring our, our whole approach. Yeah. Meg's, uh, uh, pressing the issue with agile here yeah. good job meg um <laughs> she's trying to reinstate the buzzword states i don't know if we yeah. can let her do that or not change management is the one place that i might encourage the agile topic makes some sense the reason being is that you need to learn change mindset in this topic for it to be yeah. the most most effective and 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 look i mean i think i think they're I, I understand like the word agile definitely is totally overused and I, and I hear you on that buzzword thing. I, I think there is something to be said for this notion. One of the, one of the buzz phrases that comes up a lot in different um, enterprise software is this notion of continuous. You think about um, applying continuous to almost anything and it kind of makes sense. Like, so for example, in finance, you think about the continuous close. Well, that's not totally realistic to be closing your books all the time, but can you do it more often? And can you do it more yeah. easily? Yes, that's a good idea. And and you think about that from, put that in front of performance reviews, right? Continuous yeah. performance reviews. No, not really. But can we do this more often? Can we can we reconnect on how everything is going in a more uh, versatile way, right? And so I, I understand what, what Meg is getting at there. And I think from a change perspective, definitely, because we don't want these to be static topics. We just don't yeah. want people to be patting themselves on the back too much about having agile organizations because it's like... I don't know that when, when people say we have an agile organization, I'm always like, can I do a, a formal use case on how that works? Because we'd love to learn. We'd love to learn from you. Right. We'd love to learn from it, you yeah. because it's tough. And, and, and I'm open to being proven wrong on that. Right. Like I, I think, you know, for me, it feels a bit like a buzzword, but you know, but I, but I don't disagree in how, how Meg is seeing it. Right. That, that, that there's some elements of it that really make sense. And I think that's the part, you know, that, that we could maybe take away from, but I think sometimes we try and fit that square into that round peg and or that what is it square peg or round hole, whatever it is. Right. right. But um, cause we try and take all the, 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 the different, you know, what is the work cycles or whatever they call them. I'm, I'm not an agile professional. Right. But um, all the different buzzwords that go with it. Sprints. And then you're like, well, how, how do yeah. I do that? Yeah. Sprints in, in an HR pro, right. Like, so I think some of that gets a little lost from me. Right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and that's a little bit of a distinction too, between the capital agile a and the, in the lowercase agile. Agile, yep, exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. Dr. Janice Presser, start change management by deciding exactly what you're going to change and keep it concrete, like pay equity for women in tech, yes. which by the way, would be a good one. It would be uh, nice to see it. <laughs> uh, I, I'm sorry to say, and I'm not going to say who the vendor is, but this week I had an event where five white men on, on the vendor panel bragged about their diversity commitments. You, you can't make this stuff up. <sighs> Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> women in tech, it's hard. we got some work, we got some work to do. Um, yeah, exactly. that's just a little yeah. bit of a side note, but I, I can't stand a sausage panel talking about diversity. But, okay. It's uh, hard sometimes. we, we have, we have, uh, we have two more left, right? Yeah. So, so number, yeah, the next one has to do with a little bit of just let's take seriously what we're talking about. Um, so I think people and, it, and again, it's a but it's a bit of a buzzword that's been used a lot right now, which is skills management. I think we need to really actually start taking skills management seriously. 66% of organizations um, uh, put the put recruiting metrics on their um, executive dashboards for HR, like the, the ones they sent off to senior leaders and only 7% of organizations put a skills kind of, or skills management or skills content metric on their dashboards for executives, right? Like, I think we all talk about it, but nobody is basically saying, look, we have skills gaps and some of it's because we don't know how to measure it, but I think it's more important to say, Hey, if we don't know how to measure it, we still need to be telling people that we have issues um, 40% are, of people are saying they're buying or assessing a skills management software right now. Um, I'm not sure that that's going to fix the problem, but I think we need to be elevating the conversation beyond just the problem with the pandemic with skills, right? Yeah, definitely. It, it's interesting to see a lot of leading HR vendors have put, placing a lot more emphasis on, yeah. on skills and uh, amazing how skills become skills clouds and stuff like that. It's <laughs> 
it's, it's funny how that works. But uh, but 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 I, I do think it's important. And one of the things, you know, since I have my roots in this industry, running uh, uh, enterprise software recruiting firm back in the nineties, um, the one of the things I became acquainted with was this sort of like disposable feeling about skills that has yet to be purged from corporate settings where it's like, can we get a lot better at just saying, you know what, so-and-so is a terrifically talented individual. And even though their job is going away, they really should not go away. And, and so how do we, how do we manage that? And, and look on a person to person basis, that's done very effectively. But I think to your point, how can you do that on an organizational basis? Right. And, and, and move beyond like lip service to talent and start saying, wow, we can really take pride in the fact that we can help people who believe in our organization who are really good at what they do um, transition in ways that are really compelling for everyone. And I don't think that's done very well. So yeah, I love that idea of, of metrics and visibility around that. I think that's... I think anytime you say something's important in your organization, if it's not at an executive level conversation somewhere on a regular basis in a report, a dashboard, then it's not really important, right? Absolutely. All right, you have one more. Let's have it. One I have more. A, I, have I have a one mystery more. question or two for you once you're done. So yes, yeah, no. So I, I, I'll be intrigued to hear if there's if there's any others. But this one again has hard data. The, the last one was more of a wish, I guess, because it wasn't exactly. I, I think that if we do it, I think we're going to get better outcomes based off of what I'm seeing initially in the data. But this one, this one is again like change management, where we've we've been asking questions about workforce planning for the last six or seven years in our research data. And we've asked how people are doing it. And we've qualified whether they're doing, you know, just headcount versus strategic workforce planning. And we started about three years ago comparing that against outcomes. All we would do is various uh, group of sort of index and, and outcomes in our data. And I think workforce planning is another word that people feel like, yeah, it's important, but what do I do with it? Right. You know, it's like um, we have found that those organizations who did any type of workforce planning, even if it was just headcount, got better outcomes for the last three years over and over again. So I, I you know, I, I think there's, a, it's a little bit of a, a little snootiness sometimes on the work, the people who do it strategic workforce planning, like, well, they're just doing headcount. It's not as important as what we do, which is strategic workforce planning with all this extended data. And our data shows that, look, even if you're just doing headcount planning, you're doing more than 60% of the market, right? Only about 50% of the market even do headcount planning. You're getting better outcomes because of it. So I, it, it's something I think people oftentimes um, skip over uh, when they're thinking about value on the HR side. Absolutely. It's good to see a lot of vendor investment in HR analytics and planning as well. I, I find it refreshing and I hope that it comes to more fruition as companies are able to apply those things. Uh, Brian's got a long comment that's going to like totally obscure. I know. I was like, I don't know if I can read faces, all of that. <laughs> but we're we're going to go through it. Uh, Brian says uh, companies really need to rethink uh, management, career paths, and careers, the role of alumni in recruiting. When companies will get serious about training their people instead of expecting competitors to do everyone's training. For example, great managers create a work environment that makes people want to work there years longer than they otherwise would have had. Bingo. Um, that's my comment. Once the nature of work is rethought, then we can pick the appropriate tech, not vice versa, which I think alludes a little bit to your point around not plunging into the buying decision without having a clear vision of what you're going to measure and why. Yeah. So it's it's really easy to say that to think that a certain technology is going to fix all your ails. Um, and and I'm and I get it because I was on I was on the buying side. I was I was the person who ran around like with my hair on fire saying, we need an LMS, we need an LMS and the learning function, right? Um, they mm. literally labeled me again pre 2000 So um, take that with a with the diversity grain that it is, the LMS lady, right? <laughs> that was what I was titled in the, inside the company. And I and I realized we got the LMS in the company and they weren't ready to change the culture, and so it added no value at all. Right. Um, so I think, you know, that was my, my very hard lesson to learn that you, you, companies got to be ready for this kind of change. Right. Absolutely. Okay. So now for my kicker HR question, I can ask the okay. HR expert, does a, does HR have a seat at the boardroom table today? <laughs> why or why not? Um, 
so I, I was actually having a conversation about this with someone else. And I said, HR, um, the pandemic um, gave HR every opportunity in, in a, in a, in a way that many of us probably wish it wouldn't have, but it did to be at the center of the strategic conversation in our organizations. Um, it is a check that we have not cashed is my best way of putting it. Um, uh, in all of our data, I expected to see the, the um, HR function itself say that we are seen as more strategic in our businesses. And our data showed this year, and we'll see what it says next year again, that that number did not budge. 41% of organizations felt they were strategic in, 19, in, in 2019, and 41% of organizations felt that they were strategic business partners in 2021, right? Um, mm. And... And at the same time, we saw a 10% increase in the percentage of organizations who felt that their HR technology was being used to make strategic decisions in the organization, right? So we felt our technology was being viewed as more strategic than we as HR professionals were being viewed in our own organizations. And so... Um, that's kind of a slap I in the face. That you, that's kind of a slap in the face, right? isn't it? I like your technology <laughs> better than your ideas and your and what you bring. That's how we feel, right? Like that's how. And I don't. Ouch. To me, I'm not sure this is exactly how the executives feel about us, but I think we have this internal issue, right, in HR with this. Like I, I think we're so we're too busy to understand our value almost. Right. Um, and so I think the, um, so my sense would be, we are here, um, hear us roar, stand up, take the, 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 um, take the opportunity to, um, to say, look, if you hadn't had our data, if you hadn't had our ability to make the changes, you would not have it's fair of us to say that as a business. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say this. I think, you know, HR folks have worked their tails off the last couple of years and certainly deserve kudos. But whether that is strategically impactful, I think is an interesting debate. How do you think that 41% could get up to 50 or 60? Are there one or two things that HR folks could do? Is it more a matter of presenting what they do in a more compelling way or are they changes they need to make internally? Or what do you think would bump that number? I think there's a couple of things. I think um, we, one, we need to trust the data that we are, that we have. We, we have all these systems now. I think a lot of times we, we spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, the system user experience and not enough time thinking about the data that we have in the systems and how we're going to present it. Right. Um, and so I do think we have to take some ownership that, that um, getting the next great higher important issue, right? But we need to be just as, as diligent in spending time in understanding why the 10 people who we didn't hire, right? What 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 was the data points around what didn't work for our company, right? Um, mm -hmm. And and we don't we don't think of it that way. We think, okay, we got this one thing done, let's move on to the next, right? We don't do enough thinking about what data we have that can give us more answers. And I think the other thing then is, is that in that sense of understanding that all data is valuable and can be used in different ways is that we need to really tie that back to whatever I, I can't, I, I know it's a buzzword outcome to some extent, right. But I can't tell how many times I've, I've sat down with an HR leader and the, and the biggest thing they get out of talking to me is I say, so, so what is it, this, what goal that your executive or board has right now, will this attach to? And you start to see their brain sort of spinning and you're like, if you haven't thought about that, right? <laughs> mm. then you're not doing the work you need to be doing. And I don't care what level you're at in the HR. I think you should be having that, that thought process. Right. So um, it sounds very simple. It doesn't sound like it should, you know, but it, it's a really hard thing when you're busy every day with just trying to put out fires. Meg is suggesting that maybe we need to talk about some self-esteem <laughs> training for HR leaders. Yes. I, I would agree with you, Meg, because I'm not sure that it, because when we look at executives, they're a little bit higher in their overall view, because we do have CEOs who take our survey, and theirs are slightly higher than HR, not 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 so much higher, but they are slightly higher. But I do think 
it's because they have how HR views themselves, right? And HRIT, right? The both of them that they're in this this together, and we get both we answer the survey. So yeah, um, I don't know how we do this as an industry, but we need to really say, look, you made a difference, and you need to let people know it, right? Personally, I would like to see a little more glamour attached to the HR career path. It it fe mm -hmm. feels like for so many years it's been where careers kind of go to die, and and I don't think that's right or fair. And I'd like to see young people perceive HR careers with some glamour, and and I think that could eventually happen if they're perceived as really the key to um, making sure that talent and inclusion are the overall corporate like mission and that it's realized, I think that's actually pretty sexy if it's, if it's perceived that yeah. way, you know, I, one run really interesting thing that we don't have to have a huge conversation about this, but I've, I've gotten into this whole employee experience versus CX debate this, this last couple of weeks. And I, I'm just a really, really big advocate around this notion that if your employees aren't happy, engaged, fulfilled, and well informed with the right data, of course, that your whole CX strategy is completely a fail. And um, I've had some good debates about that because some people have challenged me and said, well, you don't have the numbers to back that up. And I, I'll be the first to admit, I'm not sitting on a bunch of surveys, you know, proving that happy employees lead to a better CX. To me, it's just a no brainer, yeah. but I think it, I think it's really, really important and, and, and to get into why that is. I mean, like uh, I, I had a situation um, coming back from an event in Vegas a few weeks ago where um, I got food poisoning and um, the flights home were a complete disaster. It was not a good travel day. And, you know, I, I have already standardized my travel on Southwest, but like um, it's actually almost emotional to talk about it because I, I threw up on the plane, which is not a good experience. Of course, yeah. the flight attendants and how they handled that situation were so unbelievably exceptional. They were so kind to me and they were so, like they just knew exactly how to handle it in such a way that was so like calming and like, and I, I ended up messaging Southwest later and saying like, that was just unbelievable. I mean, I, I happen to think those particular, that particular job role is almost heroic now because of the stress that people feel when they travel right now. And, and I was just like blown away by that. And in my mind, I'm thinking like, I'm like practically a customer for life now because of that experience. They would have to do a lot of really, really horrible things to me for me to not fly their airline just because of that moment, right? Because they proved to me like in a real difficult situation, like that they were there for me. And, and so I just think that's interesting because it's like, yeah, their loyalty program's great and all the points and all of that stuff. And that's the main reason why I stuck with them. But this this is really the fundamental reason and so to me like i don't need a friggin study on employee experience to prove that i just i just know it's true you know I, well I, i'm i'm gonna push back a little bit on you all here, right, John. All right Good. Because, let's do it let's yes do it. because it's really easy to get those stories in the consumer good space right airlines yeah, you know, yeah, yeah where it gets really hard is you know i'm a manufacturer for I built ball bearings for your engine, you know, right. and, and yes, there's customers there and, and they've got to be good products and stuff, but you know, there's also this, this conversation about, um, you know, I've got to manage my business with all the different pieces and parts, right. A, that I feel like I can, I can see the value proposition of investing in certain things. Right. Um, and what I would, I don't know that happy employees um, is really the goal we want to go for. I think what we want is, and I do think that this is the term, the right term. It is engaged employees, engaged employees who feel like they have a stake in what we're doing, right? right. Not just that we are, um, but that if, if their job is done better, there is some outcome, like the engine won't blow up and you're going to save a bunch of people, right? That I'm vested in. Um, I don't think we do a good enough job helping people understand what's their, the value proposition of the work that they're doing. Right. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I get this all the time. I, I had this, we used to have this huge debate with someone about Uber drivers and whether or not that was a, a, a job that they were, you know, being, um, that was basically being, you know, exploited. And, and I would agree it's, it's, it's a, it's a highly debatable conversation about whether or not we're, we're leveraging workforce in a way that they're being uh, paid well. But I will mm -hmm. tell you in the early days, one of the things I heard time and time again from the Uber drivers that I used to work with was 
the autonomy, the freedom was so powerful for them, right? Um, if we can figure out a way to bottle that as part of what we're doing, I think you're going to get a better outcome in all areas. I just think that we have to figure out a way to get the value proposition better for the conversation, right? So that, that's yeah. my feedback. No, I really like that. And 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 look, I mean, I'm not I'm not a huge advocate of of, of happiness myself yeah. on, on any level. <laughs> Um, I've had some really interesting philosophical debates with people around this because I've said to some friends from high school, for example, I've said, well, you're happier than me, but I'm, I have more autonomy than you do. Yeah. And, and I think like it, the, there's different things like autonomy, purpose, happiness, engagement, competency, all of those things. And, and I've said before, like, I'd rather deal with a CX person who was in a really bad mood, who had the power and knowledge to fix my problem than some really happy camper who I dealt with like a Comcast the other day. How are you, John? Oh, it's great. Blah, blah, blah. I don't have the power to fix your problem, but I'm in a great mood and I'm going to kiss your ass. And you know, like that doesn't do anything. Right. And so I think you're totally right. Like, so I, I'm not insisting on like the nature of happiness at all. And in fact, like the, the, I wouldn't say the flight attendants that helped me were particularly happy. Um, <laughs> But they were except they were excessively competent, and they knew yeah. exactly what they were doing, and 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 so I think I think you, you raise a really good point that a lot of the terminology around that needs to be fleshed out, and we need yeah. to better understand that. But I'm going to continue to insist that the back end, if you want to call it that, ties into the front end, and you know, like that 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 the state of 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 your of workforce is directly connected. And if you want to go out and buy some CX software and think that's going to solve that without dealing with this core issue, I think you're mistaken. But exactly yeah. how you do it, I think we've run out of time to solve that problem today. Get in your get in your final comments. Get in your final comments in the chat because we are about to wrap. Uh, Brian pointing out that career paths in HR are going to be under attack big time soon. RPA is going to wipe out a lot of transactional clerical roles. Uh, with few people, how can someone get promoted within the function? What is the career and career path for HR folks is a great point to raise. Yeah. Um, we could probably spend a whole hour just talking about that particular point. Brian's giving me a hard time about eating eating gas station sushi <laughs> for cats in the flight. Uh, yeah, uh, point, I'm all, I'm all good. I'm all good now. I just I had a bit of a rough rough day, but you know, uh, but but I think the the really important thing here is just. That, that um I just love getting your perspective on 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 this and that that you were able to do this based on all your research was just an absolutely fantastic and I'm not grouchy at all right now I'm in a really good mood I'm so <laughs> glad you came on to the show you were friggin awesome well thank you so. I appreciate it well this is fun this is the kind of conversations I love to have because sometimes the data gets so overwhelming right like it, it, it's it's when you can put it into context into good conversation I think that that makes makes gives me a good day as well John so thanks we will we'll, we'll do a little co-complimenting <laughs> absolutely well definitely we'll try to have you back at some point and thanks to all the people in the chat for your smart commentary you really kept us on our toes today which is sort of what I always want from these events so sorry we have to end but I think we're at the point of diminishing returns for today, but I hope you guys enjoy the show. And thanks again, Stacey. For yeah. Thanks everyone. It's great. Bye. And thanks Meg and Brian team. Yeah. And Mike. Yep. Later. <laughs>